Hello, this is Tom, and I'm going to give a demonstration of manufacturing capability in Sage X3. Sage X3 has a very powerful manufacturing module built in, tightly integrated with the rest of the ERP functions uh, in this platform. And so I'm going to walk through uh, an example of actually producing a product. So we're going to go through our work order process, production tracking, and um, checking those finished goods. But before we can do a work order, we have to define some data in X3. So let's look at our prof, our product definition roadmap. And these are the steps we need to create to actually do a work order in X3. Of course, we have to have our items created. This would be finished goods and raw materials. And sometimes um, semi-finished or intermediate goods if we're doing a multi-level bill of material. So X3 can have, um, um, I can't remember the limit, is it nine? might be more levels of bills of materials. So we might have subcomponents we're building um, below our parent product or below our finished good. And we'll, we'll do an example of a two level uh, bill of material in this example. And then we also have to create our bill of material. This is our um, recipe, I guess, of how we're building our, our finished good, what raw materials we need. And we have to create a routing. A routing are the steps. It's kind of like the uh, steps of a recipe, but it's kind of the steps through our plant to produce this product. And this would be involving um, machines and operators on my shop floor. So I set up my routing to, to direct this work through my factory floor to generate that finished good. And it can be a one-step routing. Maybe it goes to one machine, it's, it's produced and it's done. Sometimes um, there's a lot of steps involved, a lot of routing steps involved. And we'll look at some of those examples, what we can set up. And then once we get this defined, once we get our bills of materials and our routings created, we can go ahead and create a work order and it's going to combine all this information into one document that we can then manage. So when we talk about our routings, I mentioned that we, we, we put machines and labor on our routings. Those are called work centers in X3. So every work center in X3 is a, a machine or a labor resource we want to use. And so let's look at those first of all. So let's go look at our work order, our work center screen. And here's some examples of some labor work centers and some machine work centers. So, so for some of our machines, we have a bending machine, automatic saw machine, a milling machine, a drill machine. Basically, we set up uh, work centers when we want to do one of two things. We, are either in, we either want to schedule that resource, that machine. We want to know what our capacity is and we want to make sure we don't overburden it. If this machine is available 12 hours a day, we want to try to schedule 12 hours of work every day on it, but we don't want to go over because um, we'd be having to go into overtime situations or, or something, or we're not getting our work done when we're promising it to our customer. So we want to manage that capacity. So I set up work centers to manage capacity or to add cost to my finished good. And we define both of those parameters on the work center. The first thing we set up is our capacity, and that is our time structure. So on this drilling machine, we have this time structure SC1. And that is defined as five days a week, eight hours a day. Let's go look at our time structures. And these are all user definable. You can create as many of these time structures as you want, and you can assign them to your work centers. Typically, most of the work centers are gonna have the same time structure because your facility is gonna be open and closed the same hours, but, but they can vary from machine to machine. You might have uh, skilled operators in maybe one shift, but maybe some, there's another shift doing something else. And so your machines might be running eight hours a day, but maybe you're doing some assembly or some piece work uh, more than eight hours a day. So you can have different weekly or different time structures assigned to each work center. So here's an example of five days a week. We're working Monday through Friday, eight hours a day. So that is our capacity. Our normal capacity is eight hours per day. Our weekly cumulative is 40 hours per week. So we assign our weekly structure to our work center, and that tells X3 what our capacity is. The other thing we define to, to or the other thing we, we um, set up to define our capacity is not only the time we're available each day, but how many of these machines we have, the number of resources or the number of, of bodies if it's a labor work center. So in this situation, we have one resource. So we truly only have eight hours a day, but we might have some other machines that are um, more than one machine. So we'll look at that. Um, nope, all my machines. So here's a labor operator where we have three resources. So we have eight hours per day, three resources. So that gives us 24 hours of capacity every day. 
So that is our capacity. The second attribute for a work center though is the cost we want to assign to this work center. And then X3 takes that cost and when I'm building products it takes that hourly rate, that hourly dollar charge and assigns it to my work in process which gets rolled into my finished good cost. And we do that by setting up these costing dimensions. And you can create a separate or a unique costing dimension for each um, work center or you can use one and share it across multiple work centers if they're similar machines, similar costs, similar depreciation, similar maintenance cost. But you can create as many of these as you want but basically you figure out what your machine cost is or your labor cost is. You create a costing dimension and then you can give it both a setup time and a run time. So sometimes a setup time for a machine might be less than the run time. Now I have the opposite situation in here. I must have been doing some uh, manipulation in here. But typically like a machine is not running, it's not uh, consuming any electricity, it's not uh, doing anything, it's sitting there idle, you might have a lower cost on it than when it's actually running. Uh, same thing with a labor resource, maybe you have a labor person and that would be a situation where maybe the setup time is, is higher, cost is higher than the run time. So one person might be managing three machines. And of course when they're setting up a machine they're probably focused on that machine, but when the machine is running they're kind of managing or overseeing multiple machines. So the run rate might be lower for that labor resource. But the point is you can set up these however you want to do that. The other thing I mentioned here is we can start assigning overhead rates to these costing dimensions and to these work centers and so we can be capturing some other cost within our our plant and uh, posting that to our general ledger or to our work in process through our overhead rates if we want to do like um, quality control cost or shop supplies things like that uh, utility cost we kind of can set up formulas on our overhead codes and assign those cost through our inventory through our finished goods as well. So that's the costing dimension setup. But those are the two key things on our work centers is setting up the time uh, capacity and our costing. Um, and if we look at some of these labor resources too, you'll just see it's the same setup, time structure, costing dimension, and then we have a number of resources on our labor. So here's our stock room attendant, one resource. Then up here is I set my machine, my work center type, machine labor. And I'm not going to talk about it, but we also can set up work centers that do subcontracting. So part of my routing steps is to send a part out for heat treating or painting or something like that. We would set up a subcontracting operation. We could put subcontracting on our, our routing step, which gets put on our work order, which we would generate a purchase order going to that supplier. We would send our work and process out to that supplier and bring it back in. But X3 will manage that entire subcontracting process. I'm not going to demonstrate that today, but that is built into the core X3 manufacturing capabilities. One thing I'll mention down here on our work centers too is once we set up this time structure, our five hours, five days a week, eight hours a day, we can come down here and X3 will actually show us our load. So I can come down here and this green line is my availability. As you can see, it says eight hours. So here's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And what I'm looking for is if I have a firm load, if I have scheduled work orders, they would be showing up in orange with a line. And then I could have MRP suggestions out here as well. I could see those. But the point is if I have anything above my green line, I need to reschedule my, my plant because I'm over capacity. So this is just a quick visual look at uh, what's going on within my work center. And uh, I don't know if I have any um, work centers with... Uh, I think I have a um, packaging machine, might have some. Here we go. See, in this situation, we are over capacity. So we have a firm load here of 91 hours, but our capacity is only eight hours a day. So in this situation, I would need to reschedule my work orders or go and look and see what's what's making up this, this set of uh, work orders and kind of move those around, either use X3 to reschedule and smooth out my load, or I might go manually and decide which ones I want to do right away and which ones I can push off. And you can see the, this black line MRP load is my dark gray box. I have some work order suggestions out here each week for like five hours. So my MRP um, planning must be telling me I need to produce some of these each week. And I'm getting five hours of, of work order suggestions out here as well. And we'll talk about that later on when we talk about MRP. So I can flip this graph and actually see the list. And then I can see my actual numbers here. Uh, I can see my daily buckets and then I can see my firm load hours, which is my firm work orders, planned, MRP, MPS. These are um, suggestions coming from the M MRP uh, system. So anyway, just one of the tools that we use to kind of manage or, or quickly see what's going on with our work centers. 
Um, <clears throat> so let's, and here's where we can start recalculating loads. We have tools over here, variations. Uh, one thing I'll mention too is we can have capacity variations, like we have vacation or plant shutdown or maintenance on a machine. This work, work center maybe have maintenance next week. So we can go in there and put a variation and say this is not available next week and change our time structure and say zero. And then also we could have replacement work centers, an alternative work center. And sometimes that might be a secondary machine. Maybe it's an older machine, more expensive to run, or maybe a little bit slower. But if our main machine breaks down or is over capacity, we'd want to roll over to that alternative work center. And so X3 will do that as well once we set up these alternatives. So anyway, that is our work center setup. Very important. We have to do that first before we actually can create a work order or a routing because uh, we need those routings to find are those work centers defined for our routing to use. So let's go look at an actual routing in X3. And here's an example of a routing to bake uh, raisin bread. And if you look at our routing operations for this, um, for this uh, raisin bread product, this finish, finish good 311, I have two work centers on here. One of them is um, this one, which would be our oven, and the next one is our packaging area. So we have a machine for our oven for baking, and then we have a machine for packaging. So if you look at this, uh, we have work center 36. That's our first routing operation. But we also have a labor operation assigned to this. So on a routing in X3, we can have two work centers on one routing step. So we can have a machine work center and a labor work center on the same routing step. And X3 is going to schedule both of those um, work centers and add the cost from both those, those work centers into our finished good cost. I'll show you that later on once we create our work order. But there is two work centers here. And then we can say how many resources we need. Remember, we can have multiple resources on our work center. We could have four of these uh, ovens, these MAC36s, but for this work order, we, for this routing, we only need one. So we can say how many resources we have because sometimes we might need more than one resource. So what this is saying is for a packaging machine, we actually need two people to staff that packaging machine. So we have two labor resources on the one machine. So it's going to add twice the cost of labor into this uh, routing step because we're using two resources, two labor resources. And then we have our time code. So this is proportional. What that is saying is over here, we're saying time per lot. So this uh, routing step, if I go up here, we're basing this in minutes. So we're saying that um, we're doing time per lot. We're doing 300 units per lot and that lot takes 60 minutes. So what this is alluding to is that this machine size is a batch process. So we can put 300 loaves of bread in the oven at one time. And it's going to take 60 minutes for them to cook and possibly cool down. So uh, we're going to do um, 300 units every 60 minutes. And then we're going to turn around and package those 300 units. And that's going to take us another 60 minutes. So that is our routing setup. Now we don't have to do this in time per lot. We could do a rate. We could do a, um, I'm going to go ahead and it's asking me, hey, you sure you want to change this? I'm going to say, yes, I want to change this. And then we can change our management unit in a lot of different ways. We could say time for one, time for 100, time for 1,000, or time per lot. So usually we set this up as time per one, but that would be a machine that is just doing a piecemeal one at a time, a assembly line, or, or some kind of um, sequential machine. Whenever we have um, larger machines that are doing batches, we usually do a time per lot. So if this was a mixing tank or something like that, we'd be doing a time for lot. But if I'm doing uh, sequential pieces, then I would figure out the time for one or the time for 100 typically and put that value in here. But we just have some different management units that we can, we can use just to make it easy to enter our time and track our time. And then we have our efficiency and shrinkage. Uh, our efficiency is 100, shrinkage is zero. If we put these in, X3 is going to use those values when it tells us, like if we sell a thousand units on a sales order and our shrinkage is 2%, we're going to be told to do a thousand twenty of that uh, for a work order to make sure we end up with a thousand usable products. So if we have any shrinkage that uh, we can put this in here and then X3 knows, and that's kind of cumulative through each step. So um, that is one uh, factor there. We also have preparation time, waiting time, post-op time. Like in the situation where we're baking bread, we might have a post-op time for cool down. Um, so it might be 60 minutes for the baking time and then maybe 20 minutes for cool down time if we, if we want to put that in here. And that's about it for our routing setup. 
setup. The big thing is the work centers, the time, and the number of resources. Once we get those put in, then we can uh, click save our routing. Let's look at a couple of different routings that are a little bit more complex. Um, going to actually produce uh, axle grease today so I'm going to bring up that routing real quick so this is a um, two-step routing as well where we're doing a premix of chemicals and then we do the final blend so sometimes if you have different um, machines you're mixing in or maybe I need to put an X number of ingredients as the first step and then I need to add some more ingredients later on I might want to break this up in multiple machines or multiple steps on my routing so anyway, here's uh, two rating, two uh, operations. Um, some of our our uh, steps can be pretty complex. Uh, this is building aspirin, um, weighing, manufacturing, mixing, and heating. Again, we can have as many steps as we want. Um, bring up an example with a few more routing operations. Okay, here is a, a good one. So here's an example a little bit different. So actually uh, this is kind of interesting. So on this on this um, routing our first step is to um, prepare materials. So what this is saying is go pull the raw materials for me. So in that situation, we don't have a machine work center, we just have a labor resource. This is just telling someone to go pull the raw materials we need to build this product. And here's what's interesting on this one is my time code. So I'm saying this is taking me eight minutes. I'm saying that's a fixed time operation. What that means is that this time does not vary with the quantity on my work order. Typically, most of your times are going to vary. So if I do a work order for one, it's going to take my run times multiplied by one, and that's what my how much time I need on my work order. But if I do a thousand units, it's going to take my routing time times a thousand, and that's how much time each routing step takes. And that's when we set it as proportional. But when we say it's fixed, it doesn't vary with my work order quantity. So when this is saying I don't, it doesn't matter if I have to pull the stock for 100 units or 1,000 units is going to take me the same amount of time. Now it truly may not take me the same amount of time, but you don't want to vary this based on your work order quantity. So you can put some number in here, some average quantity based on a normal run rate, and that's what it's going to be for that uh, labor operation. So sometimes we have steps on here simply for cleaning, either pre-cleaning or preparing the material or cleaning the equipment afterwards. So if you have those kinds of operations, you would not um, you'd have their time code as being fixed too, rather than proportional. No, many, no matter how many time, how many batches you run through the equipment, you're still gonna clean it once at the very end. So you have the ability to do that. So I just wanted to point that out, that you do have some, uh, some choices on here of how this time is calculated on my work order. So I just want to show some different work orders. Um, let's go look at our bills of materials and see how those are set up in X3. So here is my axle grease we're going to produce. And this is a two level bill of material. So the first thing I do is I do a, a bulk mixing. So this is saying this is going into a mixing tank. So I'm doing this by lot and I'm saying I'm producing 3,900 pounds for this work order. And so for this 3,900 pounds, here's the raw materials that I need. So I need 458 gallons of product one, which is this Enbright item 501, and then et cetera, et cetera. Then I need 229 pounds of this, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how I get to my 3,900 pounds. So when I do a work order, obviously I'm going to produce at least 3,900 pounds because I probably want to do a full batch, but this is my bulk product. This is the first step. And then after I produce this bulk product, I can package this. And the reason we break this into two different work orders is I probably have different packaging types. I probably have pails and drums and, and tubes and et cetera, et cetera. So I can do this bulk product, then I can take this bulk product and package it in any number of different ways. So we kind of set up these two level bills of materials whenever we're doing different packaging types of the end product. So we do a bulk product and then we, um, we uh, can mix that or package that any way we wish.
So in this situation, we have actually two different um, axle grease packaging. We have a 55-gallon drum and a 35-pound uh, yeah, pail. So in our drum, we are taking that intermediate, that bulk product, and we are saying that we need 498 pounds of axle grease going into that 55-gallon drum. And of course, we need one drum, a barcode, and a... Um, a uh, drum seal. So of those, the drum, the label, and the seal, we need one of those, one each, and 498 pounds. Now if we go look at our pail, 35 pound pail, it's still going to use the same bulk product, but we're going to have different packaging items that we're including. So we're still using the intermediate 501, but we're not using 400 pounds anymore. We're using 35 pounds. And then we have our four gallon pail, our label, and our seal. So that is our two different finished good work orders, and they are using that bulk product that we're mixing. So that is an example of our bills of materials. Um, bills of materials are a little bit straightforward. Um, one thing I'll mention in the next three is we can do some different component types. We can actually have byproducts created from our bills of material. So if we have any scrap coming off of our bill of material, say we're cutting steel or cutting wood or anything like that, we might have some scrap ends. We might want to put those byproducts back into stock either as a different item number or the same item number. So we can create byproducts from this. Uh, we also can put texting uh, line items out here. So I can create a line item in here just for text and that would be notes that would print on my job ticket for, for my staff for either the material, the stock room attendants or the uh, operators on the shop floor. But I can put text notes out there as well. But anyway, bill of material is pretty straightforward. Um, let's actually go in and create a work order. Uh, one thing before we do the work order. So X3 has a kind of a neat little tool here. And it has component requirement calculation is the official name. But what this lets me do is go in and and um, type in a finished good, or I can do multiple finished goods. Let's just do one. And let's say we want to do 48 drums of our axle bulk grease. Now I can do the first level. I have an option here, it's kind of important. First level or multi-level. Let me just show you the first level first. So when I do this and say, okay, it looks at our bills and materials, multiplies it by the quantity I said we're gonna produce, and it shows us the available quantity and in inventory versus the quantity we need if we wanted to actually do this. And if I have anything in this shortage column, it means I can't do this work order today because I don't have the raw materials available on hand. But let me close this and go back and let's turn this to multi-level. Now this is not going to show just my finished good bill of material. It's going to show all my child um, levels as well. So now when I say, okay, it blows up the entire multi-level bill of material and it shows me everything. And you can see now I do have a shortage. I am short on product raw 501, my end bright stock. I need to order at least 2,555 pounds to be able to do this work order. My work order would need 2807. I only have 251 on hand, so we would need to order those. This is just a nice quick tool to know whether uh, you can do this. Sometimes we use this if you want to know if you can build this product. You can order from the customer. Can I do this today? Can I get this out? When can I promise this? So this is kind of just a uh, quick little tool um, that let me uh, to, to see what I can produce today. So sometimes we use that. Of course, when I run MRP, MRP is also going to tell me what I need to purchase right away to do this. But sometimes I want to do a quick turnaround and say, if I get a call from sales rep or, or someone, can you do this? I might go in this component calculation and make sure that I have the raw materials available. Of course, that's only one half of the calculation. The other half is, do you have the capacity on your shop floor? Do you have machine time, labor time to build that? And that was kind of uh, involved with the uh, work centers when I gave you the graphical view of the work center before to kind of see what your capacity is and what's available. And there's some other tools for that as well. But anyway, um, we now have bills of materials, routings, everything set up. So let's actually go ahead and do a work order. Now we can go and create a work order whenever we want. But the normal flow in X3 would be that uh, you get a sales order entered or maybe there's a sales forecast generated. We run MRP, Material Requirements Planning, and MRP is going to look at our on-hand quantities, 
look at that demand, those sales orders or sales forecasts, and say, hey, you need to go build this product, and then it will give us work order suggestions. So we can rely on MRP to do all this for us, but you always have the ability to go in and manually create a work order. So let's do the manual work order first, and then we'll go back and look at MRP uh, later on. So let's go create a work order for our axle grease. So let's just go in and we're going to do our finished goods. So I'm just going to create a new work order. I click on my plus button. We're going to build this at plant, uh, at our chemical plant, because that's where this uh, product exists at. We're going to build our drums. And we're going to do 48 drums. That's our standard lot size. And so that X3 is going to tell us we should build. I don't have to build that way, but, but typically you kind of set up your default lot size to be like one entire batch. So 48 drums must be what um, can be packaged from one bulk mixing tank. So I'm going to leave it the way it is because that's going to be the most efficient for us. The one thing I'll note is we can have multiple products on our work order. So if I wanted to do the 502 as well, I could put that product on here as well. Typically we don't do that, but sometimes if, fam if products are similar, we can put those on one work order with multiple products being produced. One thing I do need to do when I'm doing this manually is I have to tell it when I want to actually start this or finish this. So I'm going to say I'm going to finish this on July 15th. If we ran MRP, MRP would fill these dates in for us. It knows the customer would need this on 716, so it knows we need to finish this work order on 715 or 714 so we can ship it to them. So if our lead times are set up correctly and in the system, MRP always tells us the last day we need to start this work order so we can meet, get it to our customer, and that kind of reduces inventory for us. So we have you know just a just-in-time manufacturing method. So anyway, I put my date in there manually for now. I'm going to go ahead and create this work order. And what X3 is going to do is for this finished good, it's going to go look at the routings and the bills of material. And it's going to bring those into my work order. And it also calculates what it thinks it's going to cost me to generate this or build this work order. So here's the components I brought in. Um, our bulk product and our packaging materials basically. And then here is our routing step. And on for our packaging, we just have that one um, machine, that packaging machine from our drums. And that's it. And then we have planned quantity of 44. And then we have a runtime of eight hours to do that. So that is our work order setup. And of course, at this point, uh, we can do a couple different things with this. We can allocate stock to it. Um, do a cost calculation again. So if we we're actually going to run this today, we would go out and run our allocations for this work order. And this is doing reserve reservations of our uh, raw materials. And you see we have a shortage here. We have a shortage of one product. So let's go see what that is. Just like on that component availability screen we were looking at a second ago, if I just go to my work order and create my work order, it's going to show me my available stock and in inventory and then my requirement on this work order. So we need 23,000 pounds of axle grease and we're short by quite a bit. We need 23,904 so we really don't have any. Our requirements and our shortage is the same. Now if you notice we do have stock available. What this is saying is that this must be allocated to different sales orders already so it's already been reserved for another customer so we're going to have to go build this, um, this bulk product before we can package it. But we do have enough uh, packaging materials so you can see the allocated quantities here. We needed 48, 48 drums, 48 uh, labels, 48 seals, and we have those available and they're allocated to this work order. But what's gonna happen now, if we run MRP, we should get a work order suggestion for this missing component. So when MRP runs, it not only looks at our sales orders and sales forecast, it looks at higher level bills or higher level uh, products and suggests my lower level work orders. So remember this intermediate 501 is a product that we build. We mix it, we have a work order. We have routings and, and bills and materials for it. So we do work orders for this product and we need to go create that. But before I go out of here, one thing I want to um, uh, look at is our provisional cost inquiry because we set up those work centers. We have our inventory cost. X3 knows what it's going to cost us to build this product. It knows it's going to cost us $98 per drum. And that is broken down with um, um, our material, which is $84, machine time of 11, 
and we have a little bit of um, labor 3.2 and we have just a sliver of overhead I can't even see what my overhead is uh, 8 cents per drum so overhead is pretty small but most of this cost is 80 is material machine and labor that's what these three this pie chart is showing us and of course we get done with this work order we've tracked all our raw materials tracked all our time this work order we'll have our actual cost and we always like to compare or look at the results on a regular basis of expected cost versus actual cost because that will show us or tell us if something is wrong with our routings or bills and materials maybe our time estimates of what it takes to package this product or our manual or mix this product is off well we want to go change that routing to make it more accurate so our costs are more accurate and our planning tools are more accurate so we always want to look at actuals versus these expected numbers on a time basis so that we can uh, we can update our um, data to make it more accurate. So that is our provisional cost um, inquiry screen. Of course, at this point, too, we can start printing our work order documents. So we have a lot of different documents we can print with work orders. We usually set up one or two of these for each customer whatever is the best fit for them for example we can do material issue instruct our report uh, for your stock room as a separate report and then our job ticket would just show our routing steps sometimes we put everything on one report and I had a couple of these already printed out so um, here's an example of the material issue slip for one work order so here's my work order number uh, material issue slip and then here's everything it needs to pull the quantities, the locations, so this is sitting in this location. And if these were lot tracked products and we had lots allocated, we'd see the lot number they need to pull. So that's all the information, the lot number, the location, the quantity they need to pull. So this is our material issue slip. And this was for a different uh, work order I was doing. I was mixing raisin bread or producing raisin bread mix. And so these are all the raw materials for, for the raisin bread. Now here's an example of a production slip that incorporates both our bill of material detail and our routing operations. Again, this is for the raisin bread mix. So here's the operations, the two steps that we are doing, or I'm sorry, the two work centers that are involved with routing operation five. This is mixing ingredients. So we're using machine 35 and labor resource 37. It's supposed to be 45 minutes. And then here's all the raw materials that are going into that routing operation. And then we have some notes down here too. Uh, one thing I didn't mention when we set up our bill of material and routing is there's text fields we can put in instructions or notes and they show on our reports or our work order documents or our work order traveler. So we can have as much information on those notes as you want. Uh, sometimes we actually include um, sections on those notes for people to sign off on. So we get the operator's name, the date and time, things like that. So we can use this as a documentation tool to track what's going on with these, these uh, jobs as they move through our, our shop floor. So anyway, this is just an example of a just simple, quick little note at the end of our production slip. And then sometimes this is a job ticket, a little bit different than the production slip, and it doesn't show the materials on here. This just shows the routing steps, how much time, what machines they go to. And again, we're showing our routing notes on this report too. The point is we have many different reports out of the box that print with the work order. We usually customize these or set these up for each customer what they want to see on these reports so they're, they're they're tuned for your business for your needs and then we don't print all these reports we might print like I said if we're doing the material report we would probably do the material issue slip and then the um, the job ticket but we can combine those together and do this production slip and print everything on one report as a job traveler so this might go to the, the shop or the uh, stock room first they pull the products, they sign off on it, but then the production slip stays with that product and goes to the machine to be mixed. And so that work order traveler stays with the uh, product as it goes through your, your shop floor. So a lot of different options. Um, just want to show some of those reports real quick. Um, so our work order is done. Actually, we're going to go run MRP right now because as we looked before, we're short a product here. We're short. We need to do this work order. It's scheduled, but we don't have this intermediate 501. Um, so we need a work order to do this. Now, I could just go in and create a work order for this product just like we just did for the finished good, but I want to show the MRP process and how MRP works. So let's go actually run MRP. 
So typically what we do is we set up MRP to run automatically every night. So we don't actually um, do this, but we can run this anytime we want. But typically we set it to run every night. Sometimes we run it throughout the day. But a lot of times we just run it at night because when you come in in the morning, you're going to work on these MRP results. You're going to look at what MRP says you need to produce or what you need to purchase, and you're going to act on those. You're going to convert those suggestions into firm work orders, firm purchase orders. Um, so I have an invalid uh, bill of material out there that's looking for products that don't exist at this site, but that's fine. Um, let's go look at our MRP results. So MRP looks at what what we're short and tells us what we need to build. And it's looking at this over time. So when we set up MRP, we set up the time bucket to use. And you have a couple choices, usually three choices. We have daily buckets, weekly buckets, and monthly buckets. And so typically what we use is a weekly bucket that seems to be the best fit for most people. And what that is saying, it looks at all my demand, all my sales orders, and puts them into a one week bucket, then figures out what it needs to produce all the work orders it needs to do, all the raw materials it needs to get in before that week begins to actually do the manufacturing for that week. So if we're doing a, um, so if we're doing weekly buckets and let's say that the MRP is looking at the week of July 20th, it's gonna look at all the things we need to deliver for this week, figure out what we need to manufacture. And if we can do them that week, we'll do them that week, but it might back up our manufacturing to the week before, depending on how long it takes to do that work order. And then whenever the work order starts, it knows it needs to have the raw materials here. So it looks at our raw material situation and then it'll give us raw material suggestions. But those, those work orders and raw materials are gonna be within that week. So it's gonna look at an entire week at a time. It's kind of one bucket. So it's not gonna tell us to purchase the same ingredient all five days. It's gonna give us one purchase order suggestion for that product for the entire week. So that's kind of how we typically set it up as weekly buckets seem to be the most efficient for people. So you're not ordering the same product every single day or doing a work order for the same product every day. You kind of do it as a weekly, weekly um, analysis or a weekly planning exercise. So we ran MRP. So let's tell us what it gave us. Now, one thing I'll mention is MRP never does anything, um, never schedules or releases anything to the shop floor or to your suppliers. All it does is build suggestions. And then you need to look at those suggestions and then either approve those or modify those or you sometimes reject those. But those suggestions are, are managed through these workbenches. So X3 has these tools to go through and look at those, those um, results. That's why we typically run, only run MRP at night. We run it at night, you come in the morning, and then you have all day to kind of look at those suggestions, figure out what you want to do, or you want to schedule those, talk to various people about when you want to do things. You might need to talk to purchasing and see when they get certain products in, or if they want to ex expedite some things, you might need to talk to a sales rep and say, hey, if we can move this job back a week, it kind of fits our schedule better. So, so by running MRP just at the night, it kind of gives you the day to look at that result of all those suggestions and figure out what you want to do. But let's go in the manufacturing workbench and see those suggestions. So I'm going to go to my um, chemical plant and search for all my MRP suggestions. And then here's what's out there. And so it's showing me both my firm work orders. These are work orders that are already out there. And what I'm looking for is anything in, in colors. If there's something in red that has a red highlight, it means it's... Um, in trouble that's behind schedule or I haven't been I'm not gonna be able to meet my commitment so this is good I don't have anything in in red so that's fine but you notice I do have a couple suggestions on these firm work orders the message here is cancel these so I have two work orders out there and maybe I've canceled those sales orders so it's telling me hey you got a work order out there but there's no demand for this product you can go ahead and cancel these um, and then over here I have a reduce message I have this product out here and it's telling me to reduce this because I'm overproducing and then on this work order for my intermediate problems telling me to increase it. It says I need more of those. So that is out there as well. So sometimes your firm work orders show up in MRP to tell you to change those because the demand has changed. This might be linked to a sales order, the sales order changed, and so you can cancel that work order. But here is the one that I was looking for was my uh, intermediate 501, my bulk grease that we need to produce for our work order. So we have the finished good work order out there for that 501. And uh, but we were missing the bulk product. And so MRP says, hey, you need to go put us that bulk product before you can do that finished good packaging. And so it gave us this suggestion. And um, it gives a lot of detail over here. I'm not gonna go through what all these mean, but basically um, these are all kind of linked together. 
if you want to trace them all the way through, but I'm not going to go through that exercise right now. The only thing I want to do is I want to take the suggested work order and turn it into a firm work order, which means that I can actually schedule it, allocate stock to it. Um, these suggestions don't need to be acted on. Next time I run MRP, it deletes all the suggestions and recreates them. So these suggestions, if I don't act on them today, they'll be there tomorrow if the same demand causes, causes MRP to make that suggestion. But let's go ahead and let's go ahead and release this. So I can come in here and I can simply say plan or initiate. Now one thing I can also do in here, and I'll show, I can go into my grouping workbench. In the grouping workbench, what it's going to do, if I'm looking at this item and I say go into grouping workbench, it should bring up all those products, all those suggestions that are out there and let me group them together into one. So I only have one out there that's within my time frame, so I brought one up. But this is more important on the purchasing side. I might have the same product I'm purchasing every single week because I have weekly buckets in MRP. But I might want to make one large supplier, at the, one large purchase order to the supplier at the beginning of the month to get better pricing or get a full truckload of product. So I can take those individual weekly suggestions and group them together into one larger transaction. So that's what the grouping does. But I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to take this work order and I'm going to release it. So I'm going to do the plan initiate. Now when I do this, it lets me actually change my quantity. I could overproduce. I could look at this and say, well, I know I need some more of this bulk products. I need to package something else. I could change my 23,000 pounds to 40,000 pounds or whatever I wanted to. I'm going to leave it as is. I can change the dates. I can change some other things, quantities, dates, and whatnot. I'm just going to leave this all as is and just release this. And this will actually create my work order for me. So I'll let that go. And now that one is done. Now that suggestion that was there a second ago is now a firm work order. That's what it's telling me. So this was a suggestion before, now it's a firm work order and we have work order 105. So let's go look at work order 105. And there's tools I can take all my suggestions and convert them into firm. And once you get MRP fine-tuned so that all the parameters feeding in MRP are accurate, you might actually do that. You can actually automate some of this so you're not looking at every individual suggestion. But typically at first when you start using MRP before you get it all dialed in and set up correctly, we're going to manage those in detail and look at those. And then at some point you start trusting the system and then you can automate some of that, some of that approval process. But here is the bulk product, or yeah, the bulk product we needed to produce before we can package it. So it's now out here. Um, and we do have a shortage on here. So when we created that work order, our rules in X3 were to allocate stock to that work order, and it did, but you see we have a shortage here. We don't have enough end bright stock. So we're short 2,500 pounds. So let's go look at our purchasing workbench. Now I'm not gonna run MRP again because we should already have a suggestion out there for that purchasing of that product because MRP knows that when it created that work order suggestion, it needed to create a purchase order suggestion for anything that was short on the bill of material for that work order. So um, we should have our shortage out here already queued up for a, a um, purchase order. Um, now there's different views of these, uh, I guess I'll just use this one. There's different views of these MRP results. So before for the work order, I was looking at enterprise planning. I'm, and then we drilled into the grouping workbench. I'm actually in the grouping workbench right now on the purchasing side. So I could just type in a product and I would see all the, um, all the uh, products, all the purchase order suggestions for that product. So I know that was a raw 501. Um, I'm in the wrong screen here. Sorry, I'm just going to go choose it. Supply Enterprise Planning. And I'm going to look at all my purchase order suggestions. For Site 23. So here they are. And then here is the one that I am short, my raw 501, and I need that on 7.6, 7, 7 13. That's my weekly bucket that it's looking at, and I need 30,000 pounds. So here is the product, and I know that's the product I needed because I was looking at uh, this component, raw 501. I am short this. So I must have some other needs for that product as well. That's why it gave me more quantity than I was looking at. 
I also have a default supplier set up for this product, ESO59. So that is looking at my item master setup to see which one it should should purchase from. Now I can change that supplier, kind of the same thing as the um, as the um, work order grouping and work order initiation. So let's go ahead and actually create this purchase order. So it brings the product up, it brings my quantity in. Again, I can change my quantity I want to purchase just like I could do on my work order. I also could change my supplier. This is coming in from ESO59. I could use a different supplier if I wish. I'm going to leave this as is and just create my purchase order. So I'm going to release this. And I don't have the right uh, taxing information for that. So it is still suggested. I'm going to go ahead and change my supplier then on this one. Uh, this is doing an import from overseas and so it doesn't have the right uh, setup for that product for that order. So let's just change our supplier and see if that'll work. There we go. Now we got our purchase order created. Purchase order 230090 from Easton Chemical. So that is kind of how we run MRP. As I said, we run it usually once a day, and then we use the planning workbenches on, work, on purchasing and manufacturing to manage those suggestions, see what we need to do, and then actually release those to firm purchase orders, firm work orders. Um, as I said, there are tools that we could take the MRP results and sometimes automatically convert those, but a lot of times you want to look at those and confirm. You might want to confirm pricing with your supplier. You might want to change the default supplier. You might want to change uh, the date on your work order, maybe change the quantity. So that's why we sometimes go through those workbench um, purchasing and work order workbench tools. So we do have our purchase order created. We need to get that that um, raw 501 product into inventory before we can do our work order. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's look at our purchase order first of all. Here is our purchase order for the 30,000 gallons that we need for that raw 501. So that is this purchase order for this supplier. So let's just go in and do our normal receipt. Say we emailed that purchase order off to our supplier. A couple days later it comes in. We go and actually do our receiving for that uh, product. Now one thing I'll mention, remember we're shortage here on this uh, work order. So um, um, what's, looks what happens after, let's look, let's watch what happens after we do that uh, purchase receipt. So we have a shortage of the 501 on our intermediate, our bulk product. So let's go do the receipt. So I'm going to flip over to my other tab. I'm going to do a new receipt. We're receiving into our chemical plant. And a 059 is our supplier. And then I can go choose my purchase order that I'm receiving in. So here's the one that we just did. That is the raw 501, 30,000 gallons. We could have four or five different items on that purchase order. We could receive all line items in at once, or we could do each individual line. I'm just gonna bring them all in, bring in all the quantity that we need. I'm not gonna change anything. I'll just let it come in. Um, and then go ahead and create this. So that is done. But notice what it did here. So when X3 has stock coming in, either from a work order or from purchase order receipt or a miscellaneous receipt, X3 will go through and look at all the shortages I have in the system for this product. So for 501, it starts looking through its inventory allocation system, looking for shortages, and that allocates to 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 the oldest or the um, the oldest uh, document. So in this situation, remember our work order we created 105. It actually went and found that shortage out there and allocated to my work order. So um, I just wanted to point that out that the X3 handles these allocations automatically in these shortages, or that's a rule that you can turn on. So now when we go into our work order 105, that shortage is magically gone. X3 has already allocated this, fixed our shortage, so now this stock is available. So I would, uh, so now I can go ahead and run this work order. So now this is done. Um, we've allocated to the work order. So we printed out our work order traveler. We have all that done. So now we actually can actually track this or produce this on our shop floor. So let's go look at our process map again. So if you look at this whole process now, we ran MRP, we went to manufacturing workbench, we created a manual work order, and we've also gone to our product definition and looked at all the things we need to set up for a work order. So we've done everything up to the point of actually producing product. So now we're going to start focusing on producing that product. And what that is called in X3 is production tracking. 
there's a lot of different ways. We have different uh, time entry, production planning, shop floor control systems. Uh, that's a little bit too involved for this demonstration. I'm just going to use our production tracking document. The first thing I'll mention is that uh, we can customize this or break this into different parts because we're really doing three things when we talk about production tracking in X3. Number one, we're talking about checking in our finished good. That's one of, one of the three uh, things we do with production tracking is check in our finished good. Number two is we use production tracking to issue raw materials to the work order. So that is one phase of production tracking is issuing raw materials to the work order. Now what we can do is we can allocate, we can issue all the work orders that we've allocated to the work order. But sometimes if you have a problem, you can you can over issue. So if I have a product that's going to the work order, maybe I damage it. Maybe I'm cutting steel, I cut it at the wrong dimension. So I'd have to go in and allocate more stock to that work order. You can over allocate to the work order. You can under allocate to the work order. And then you're going to have variation, variances at the end of your work order for extra costs or less cost. But but uh, we do all the material issues to the work order through production tracking. The third thing we do through production tracking is labor or uh, time. We can post our time against those routing steps. And so we can have either in employees posting their time individually or we just put the group time. We can put uh, machine time, total hours in there. So when we start talking about individuals posting time, then we start using the shop floor module that lets us track each employee employees time and what they're posting to work orders or or non-direct labor like break time, training meetings, safety meetings, um, facility maintenance, things like that. We can do that through the shop floor, but I'm not going to show that today. I'm just going to go on the production tracking and just show the production tracking method in X3. So as I said, we can customize the screen and sometimes we break this up so that there's three separate versions of the screen. One for operation tracking, which is our labor tracking. A second version just for production reporting, which is our finished goods. And the third for material tracking, which is just issuing um, material to the job. But the nice thing about the screen is sometimes some companies we want to do back flushing. So in that example of um, of uh, baking bread, sometimes our, our ovens are running you know, 24 seven, we're not shutting down. We don't track actual time against each batch or, or anything like that. We just want to check on our finished goods and maybe back flush, uh, use our routing time and our um, bill of material um, quantities to track against that finished good. So some companies, just because of your nature of your process, you can't track actual detailed labor or raw materials to the work order, then we do, can just do back flushing. So sometimes we do one production tracking for all three components, operation, production, and material tracking. That's more like a black flush operation. And that's what I'm going to do right now, just to kind of walk us through what's happening here, what's going on in the system, but just to get through this a little bit quicker. So I can come in here, I can create a new transaction, and I'm going to say what site I'm working at, NAO23, and I can choose my work order. And a lot of times we print barcodes on those work order travelers, so I can just scan that work order number in. But I know I need to do my bulk product, which is 105. I'm going to track that today. And then I have check marks here for what I want to track. I'm going to leave all three turned on. I'm going to track all three sets of data in one step. Now again, I could just do one of these, or I can have a version of the screen that just does one of them, just operation, and these fields are hidden or, or disabled. I can't check them. I'm going to do all three at one time, though. So let's just walk through this. So here's my operations, first of all. So X3 is going to populate this for me. It fills in all my um, all my um, routing steps on here with the time remaining on my work order. It just fills them in. And if I have a variance, I can go ahead and fill that, or I could change that if I wanted to. I also can put my actual quantity produced on that. So if I'm doing like different shifts, I can have each shift post a uh, production tracking with the quantity they achieved on their shift if I wanted to do that. I'm just going to leave this as is. We're not going to have any variances on our work order. So I'm just going to take our total quantity that we produce on our work order, actual time, setup time, run time, so 2.39 hours. Let's leave those as is. And then down here is our manufacturing section. This is our production tracking of our finished goods. So here's our finished good, our 501, our bulk grease product. Our work order said we need to do 23,904 pounds. And I'm going to track 23,904 pounds. Yep, come out perfectly. And then we can put it in a location too. We can put it away in a certain location. If we have quality control turned on, this might be going to a queue status for inspection, but I'm not going to talk about quality control right now. 
So we, tr we track, um, we, we uh, tell the system where we're going to store this product as that we've produced. And then down here is where we choose our raw materials or issue our raw materials. So um, we have an issue with two of these products here, uh, kerosene and this product. Um, we didn't track any product. And I'm just going to leave those um, as exceptions. Uh, it must be, it could be an expired product that is not letting us actually use those. Um, so we do have, to, to, and we can go in and choose what lot number if we're doing lot tracking in our inventory. So they don't have anything available for this product. So I bet you this was like a, um, a lot with uh, expiration dates or um, expiration dates on the product and we probably even though we said we had it in stock that product is probably expired and we can't use it so I am going to say do not track do not track and we will just exclude these products from our our work order now we should be able to go ahead and produce our production tracking and now we are done. We got a tracking number and these products are done. So this has actually updated our system. It's making GL posting, it's making inventory updates. We pulled certain uh, materials out of stock and we checked in finished goods as well. So let's go look at that real quick and, and see what we did. Um, a couple different ways to go look at this. Um, let's go look at our work order first of all, I guess. We can kind of drill through this by looking at our work order. So here's our finished good first thing we can do is look at the status of our work order and this kind of gives us a graphical view of what we did. So if I go down here and look at this I can see here was my plan quantity this is my finished good my 501 and here's what we've actually achieved 23904 and like I said I didn't change anything so we completed what we said we're going to complete so that's completely done. Here's the components that we used and some of these we did not use. You see the consumed quantity, I deleted these three items so we did not consume them. They're still allocated in inventory and I think they're allocated against an expired lot. That's why we had those red messages on our production tracking. But if you look down here in our graph, you can see that here is our required quantity and what we tracked. You can see for these three products, I did not do any tracking. There's no orange line there. We did not consume those. And then here's our labor operations, um, expected quantity, expected time. It's the same as our, our actual routing steps that it should be. So there is our, our statuses. One other thing I'll look at real quick is let's go look at our um, stock by site. And now we have um, this product available right here. Um, I'm going to go in and look at... detailed stock transactions. So you can see here's our work order receipt that we just did for 23904. So this is the actual stock history for this product. And if I go over here a little bit farther, I'll see the lot number that X3 assigned to this product. And then if I come over here even farther, I'll see that this was the work order tracking. And this came from work order 105. So this is kind of my stock, my inventory history. I can have all my movements in here. So I'm just looking at this one product for the last eight days. If I go back farther, I'll see more history for this product, obviously. But uh, by default, we kind of limit this. So we just see the recent transactions. But here's all the various transactions for this product for this site. So that's all kind of an X3. I just want to kind of prove that we did do that work order receipt. We've updated inventory. So now remember that we had to do that bulk product because we didn't have enough inventory available on our finished good product. Remember we had to run MRP to get the work order suggestion for a bulk product and we had to run uh, look at our purchase uh, work branch to do the purchase order for the one raw material that we're short on. Remember that um, that was work order 104 that we actually manually created at the start of this whole process. So now let's go look at work order 104. And if you remember, we were short, we had a shortage on 501. And again, just like on our previous product, X3 knows that when we did that production, that we can go ahead and allocate to this work order and we're no longer in shortage on this work order. So now we can go actually go ahead and package up this bulk axle grease into our drums. So now we can do the production tracking against this work order and create our finished good. And now we can go ahead and turn around and ship that to a customer. 
So that's to complete our loop, let's go ahead and do our production tracking for that product. Go for that work order. And AO23, our work order was 104. Track it today. Everything should be filled in. I'm not going to change anything. Well, maybe I will change something. Let's just say we did only got 47. Maybe we spilled one drum on the floor and contaminated the product and we couldn't use it. So we're going to say that we're only doing 47. And we're going to say that, uh, yes, this is closed. Now, typically what we could do is we could scrap that product if, if, if we needed to. But I'm just going to say 47 is what we completed. But we're taking out the raw materials for 48. So we're going to have a variance on this work order. Um, so all these should be allocated. So let's go ahead and create this. So here's the lot complement. What this is saying for our finished good, um, we can put some attributes on that lot. So this product does expire and expires in uh, 24 months. So here's our expiration date for that finished good. So X3 is tracking all that for us. And let's override the date if we want to extend that or change that slightly. I'm going to leave it as is and go ahead and create that finished good with that lot number. And then we're done. Now we've created our finished good and now we have that available in stock. So we can go uh, look at that. Let's go look at stock by lots. Let's bring up our N323 site. Here's our finished good that we just produced. And here's the 47 drums that we just produced. On 7.2, here's the tracking that we used to create that. And then we could drill in and see some more information about this and tie this back to our work order and whatnot. But um, that's fine for now. So anyway, that is done and that is an inventory. So now we could sell this to a customer. A couple things, um, I'm go back to my work order real quick and let's go look at our, our finished good work order. We had a little bit of variance there. So now if we go to our whip cost inquiry, we can actually go look at this and see what our variances were. Um, I actually haven't run the, the posting process yet in the background, but if you look at the screen here, we have um, actuals, expected, rejected, variance. So the expected is our theoretical from our bill of material on our routing and our actuals, what we actually posted. And then our variance will be the difference between the two. So in this situation, we would have a variance on these two because we didn't produce what we uh, had scheduled. We only produced 47 drums instead of 48. So we would have a variance on that. Um, I just have it posted or run the tool that actually does the posting so we don't actually hear here's some of our variances right here. Um, so we are showing some variances on that. Oh, let's track the, the variances on the work order. I just haven't posted them to GL yet. That's why this grid is blank. But here's what uh, our work order totals are. So we do have some variances on this because we didn't produce as much as we thought we would. So X3 is tracking all that for us. A couple other things I wanted to show real quick is some of the tools we use to manage our operations. We have our Work Center queue, Work Center dispatch. We have some other inquiries, but let's just look at our Work Center queue real quick. This is something we can use to manage what uh, is going on in uh, the various Work Centers. So let's go look at uh, Work Center 34. Um, I'll look at anyone here. So the work centers are actually tied to um, to sites. So usually you're looking at one site, but uh, I just want to find something with uh, some data in it. Find the machine work center. Go to the next page. Here's all our labor work centers. All right. Uh, let's look at our um, spice mixer, I guess.
So let's look at our load by work center. So MAC042 I think has some jobs. I can go ahead and search and this shows me my entire load. <laughs> Typically we might change this date range to filter it down. I have a lot of different uh, data out here. Now what it's showing me right here are suggestions too. This is MRP suggestions that MRP says I need to do on these dates that have not been uh, firmed up yet. The green lines, these OWF are firm work orders. These are things I've actually said I'm going to do. You can see some of these are in process, some of these are pending. Um, in process means that work order has been started. I've tracked material or, or time to that work order, so it is in process. Pending means that it's just a work order that's a firm work order that I haven't actually allocated or I'm sorry, haven't issued any inventory to or anything yet. So no transactions have been posted to it yet. But anyway, this is a tool that I can use. And what I do sometimes is I can start filtering this. So I can say, um, I can use the uh, calendar here to uh, do a certain date, 628 to 74. I can see all the jobs I need to do for one week if, if I wish. Um, go back a little bit and show a little bit more. it all out. Um, there we go. And then we can print this out. This would be like our um, one version of our of our work for the week, possibly. Another nice thing I like to do is once I have this turned on here, I can go to my graph and I can graph these out and see what I need to do. This is kind of the graph we were looking at before the work center, but I just see uh, uh, this a little bit a little bit quicker, a little bit easier. So you can see I'm pretty low on my utilization. My total load is below my capacity. So I have plenty of time available to work on this, to add work orders to this work center. Uh, one thing I'll mention on this is I can change my different reporting buckets on this. So I could do this in weekly buckets if I wish. So you see, we do have a spike here. We have a bunch of jobs um, <clears throat> on uh, 720. So I do have a work order out there that needs to be rescheduled or moved around. And I have suggested total load uh, both out there. So these different colors tell me what kind of transactions they are. Um, so that is that. If I go a little bit farther, I should see those jobs. Let's go out to the end of the month, search on that. No, I'm not seeing those here. Uh, there's some extra selections on criteria that I can see. I can filter these. Um, I can only look at certain things so I can kind of filter my list so I'm looking at a more concise uh, view. The other thing that we can do is, is quite often we do what's called a dispatch report. So I have a report that I can run that I can go in, enter a certain time frame. So for next week I could do uh, a certain uh, dispatch report for the work centers. And what this does is I actually have this printed out already. <clears throat> Basically for that week, I would see all the uh, work orders that one work center. So here's work order, work center 42. Here's all the jobs they need to run within a certain time frame. So this is a page break on each work center. So each work center, so I can run this report from my, my site, my plant. And that's kind of the work that everyone needs. So if you're doing your planning meetings and whatnot, you can kind of run some of these reports and, and then hand people out. And of course, we can modify these to make these more concise from more useful reports. A lot of the extra reports have a lot of information on them, but sometimes it's nice to rearrange just a slightly to make it a little bit easier to read. So we can certainly do that very easily. And we've done that many times before. <clears throat> So that is just a couple of the tools, you know, our work center queue, our dispatch reports, there's a lot of other tools, inquiries, uh, reports, dashboards, we can look at to manage our, our work orders, our schedules and whatnot. But um, that is just kind of a high level overview of doing manufacturing in X3. Thanks for watching.